for just a moment this morning, Hebrews chapter number six. I trust that you uh, are enjoying this beautiful weather that I asked God to give us. I'm not sure that's why he gave it, but that's what I asked for anyhow. All right, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter number six. Hold your place there, Bennett. Our theme verse for this year, I think, is a good one. Uh, Ephesians 3 and verse 21 says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful thought, if you would please, for those who don't have much to say positive about the church. When the Bible says that's where God gets his glory. Think about that now. Not through the uh, the Athletic Association and not for bull riders for Christ or rodeos for Christ or jumping jacks for Christ. The Bible says that Christ gets glory in and through the church. Isn't it amazing? Well, we'll have church down by the river. How many missionaries are you supporting down at the river? Well, we'll have ours at the uh, coon hunters for Christ. That way we can all turn the dogs loose after a while. Well, I wonder how many missionaries the coon hunters for Christ are supporting. I wonder if they get through praying, if they get mad at one another, if they don't win the coon hunt. Just wondering, you know, I don't want to make anybody mad. I wouldn't want to do that at all. All right. Well, since I got you in a good spirit, let me read for you just a little bit out of the Bible. Look at Hebrews chapter number 6. Verse 6, chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance for good from dead works or faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptism or laying on of hands or resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permitted. Now jump down to verse 9 because there's some verses there that's Difficult to interpret, and many folks really get confused in these verses. I just said that so you'd read them while I'm reading the rest of this. <laughs> you think I don't know what you're doing, right? <laughs> Verse 9, but beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I'd like to take just one phrase, one phrase out of that text, and I want you to look at the phrase. I don't know if you underline your Bible or not. If you do, this would be a good verse, to have a good phrase. Verse 9, things that accompany salvation. You got that? Things that accompany salvation. What things should accompany you being saved? 
how should you act because you have been saved? What should our attitude be since we've been saved? Things that accompany salvation. That's a good thought, isn't it? I know you've thought about it regularly. But I'd like to talk to you today about stewardship is responsibility. Not money. Responsibility. Amen. Two weeks ago I talked and spoke on stewardship is faith living or living a life without limits. Stewardship is living with the limits of God. Stewardship is getting God in on our little deal. Thus turning our little deal into a big deal. Stewardship is natural living, is not natural living, it's supernatural living. Stewardship is taking just a pot of oil and doing with that pot of oil what God says to do with that pot of oil and watching God supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory his way. You understand that? Wouldn't it be nice if we'd all get involved in that? Living beyond our limits is a blind man who is limited to what he can see, what he can comprehend. And then God saying, be it unto you according to thy faith. And the next verse says, and his eyes were opened. Do you understand that? Wouldn't it be nice if God could move us out of our little thinking and start turning our hopeless situation into a God-honoring victory? Well, it's just too far gone. Oh, shut. I mean, would you please... Is there a good verb I could say? <laughs> Stewardship is getting God in on our situation. Last week I spoke on stewardship as priorities. A changed life requires changed priorities. When I got saved, I no longer had a desire to go to the places I used to go. When I got saved, God changed my taste about things that I desired and wanted. So thusly, when I got saved, it required that I take on new priorities. I no longer went to Oklahoma to gamble my money away on Saturday night, but I prepared a Sunday school lesson to teach fifth grade boys on Sunday morning. A changed life necessitates change priorities. Amen. Things that accompany salvation. Stewardship is responsibility. Stewardship is taking those responsibilities and doing with that responsibility that which honors God. Stewardship is responsibility. Have you noticed it seems that few in the day in which we live 
are willing to accept responsibility, whether it be Democrat or Republican, dummy or the rest of them, whether it be president, speaker, or not speaker, it's somebody else's fault. Is that not so? It is just absolutely somebody else's responsibility. If I should get into financial situations and financial trouble, it surely is not my fault. It's because credit is so easy to get and to obtain. After all, they sent me a pre-approved card. Shouldn't I just load her up? Not my fault. It's the system in which we live. It surely could not be my fault. The government just needs to protect me from getting into debt. It's got to be somebody else's fault. Just because I'm so broke, I cannot pay attention. Surely it's not my fault. Now you hang on. I feel something coming on. <laughs> if I develop lung cancer from sucking on wheelbarrows and mall barrels and blowing secondary primary smoke in everybody else's face and then somebody did diagnose me as having lung cancer. Surely it's not my fault. It's some stinking cigarette company's fault. And they owe me because it's not my fault. We sue. It's not my fault. Although it said on the package, this is going to kill you. It's not <laughs> my fault. It's somebody else's fault. The government should shut that down. He, the government should protect us from idiots like myself. <laughs> and should I go into a rage and grab a gun and shoot somebody? It's not my fault. It's the gun's fault. The government needs some more, I'm more peace politicians <laughs> to protect us because it's not my fault. Should my wife kick me out of the house because I look like a happy motorcycle rider with bugs in my teeth Hadn't taken a bath in several months because we're saving on water. I need to pay for my golf clubs. Surely it's not my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Hmm? If I can't blame the preacher, I'll blame the school. If I can't blame the school, I'll blame Miss Ginger. She should straighten the preacher out. But you can bet it's not my fault. If I'm so nervous, I'm about to crowd up and go all directions at one time. I'm so apt on taking nerve pills, I can drive down the highway 80 miles an hour and bounce one off a telephone pole and catch it as I go by. It's not my fault. Just not my fault. We just need to blame somebody else. If I'm unhappy down at Joshua Baptist, it's not my fault. People are not friendly anymore. But do you know somebody didn't shake my hand the other day? I told Sean not to let you. So I guess it's my fault. People just not as friendly as they used to be. It's got to be the preacher. 
It certainly couldn't be my fault. Now, I haven't opened the Bible in several months, but it couldn't be my fault. The only prayer I pray is maybe God would kill the preacher real quick. <laughs> but it's not my fault. I'm mad, puffed up, miserable. Couldn't be my fault. I'm going to vote independent next time. It may <laughs> be their fault. And we blame hereditary, environment, politics, pressures, poverty, prejudice, abuse. And you talk about abuse. My mom and daddy abused me terrible when I was a kid. Hmm? And if my daddy and mama were living today, I'd turn them in. <laughs> and if you don't like the way I am, it's their fault. <laughs> Couldn't be my fault. Now let's screw that nut a little bit tighter and run it down to the spiritual realm. Things that accompany salvation. We're living in the day of smorgasbord Christianity. We're in a world of hurt. There is little to none allegiance to the local church. You show me one believer in the New Testament that did not immediately affiliate he or herself with the local church. Not the church of their choice because there wasn't but one. Well, the Baptist is just too strict. The non-denomination not strict enough. I got me a TV preacher. Keep him cards and letters coming, folks. For just a moment, and it's from the spirit I gather, it's just going to be a short moment, I'm sure. But I'd like to talk to you about things that accompany salvation. Stewardship is responsibility. Are you willing to accept your personal responsibility? for those things that accompany salvation. In other words, a dog barks, a cat meows, Baptist gripe. Those are things that, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Things that should be manifest in our life if we are saved. The first one I find is, it is my responsibility. My responsibility. After I get saved, to belong to a local church as a member. Local church. Matthew 16, 18. The Bible says, and I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ said, it is his church. And it's in his church he receives glory. We're without end. Amen. Every body that has been saved, S-A-V-E-D, saved, 
Red, yellow, black, and white, little, big, or old and young. After you get saved, the first thing that ought to accompany your salvation is baptism. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added to the number that day 3,000. Get this. What do you think takes place when you get in that baptistry and say that I am burying the old man like Christ was buried and I'm being raised by the glory of the Father like he was raised by the glory of the Father to walk in newness of life? What do you think takes place? You become a member of that local church. If you have never been baptized, you are disobedient, absolutely disobedient to God. And every time you pray, if you knew anything about your Bible, it would come ringing through your heart, why haven't you been baptized? Disobedient. Willful, disobedient to God. The thing that accompanies salvation is you become obedient in the matter of baptism. Thusly, that makes you a member of that local church. That is your responsibility. And stewardship is responsibility. Boy, my amens are getting thin, I tell you. I don't, I don't want to upset, make anybody mad. But Matthew 16, 18 says that Jesus said, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that word church is the word ecclesia and it means a local called out assembly. A local called out assembly. It was used for political assemblies. It was used as a town hall assembly. And Jesus used the word ecclesia saying and I will build my ecclesia, the local called out assembly, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if you are not a member of a local New Testament church, you've done miss the first requirement of those things which accompany salvation. Amen. And the Bible said it's required and a steward that a man be found faithful. Amen. Amen. So I just thought I'd lay that. An R.G. Lee, I don't know if you ever heard of R.G. Lee or not. He was a great, great preacher of days gone by. I, I was so privileged to hear him preach. And if you ever get an occasion to get a tape or a CD of him preaching, I, it, he had such a grasp of the English language it was absolutely uh, astounding. And somebody asked R.G. Lee, can you be a Christian without joining a church? And he said, most certainly yes. It's kind of like being a student and not going to school. He said, it's kind of like being a soldier but won't join the army. He said, yeah, it's kind of like being a salesman with no customers. Kind of like being a tuba player with no orchestra. Like being a parent without a family. A football player without a team. A politician who is a hermit. <laughs> A scientist who does not share his findings or a bee with no hive. 
things that accompany salvation. And the first one ought to be, you ought to be a member of a local New Testament church. Amen. I did not say a member of a Baptist church. I did not say a member of a Catholic church. I said a New Testament, local New Testament church. Because there's a lot of Baptists that are Baptist in practice but not in doctrine. I don't know about all the rest of them, but I can tell you about this one. This one is a local New Testament Baptist church. I don't agree with a lot of Baptists. I don't agree with most Baptists. I agree with Baptist doctrine, but most Baptists plumb forgot all about that. So, to be a good short, you ought to fall in line with those things that accompany salvation. Now, could I give you a next one because you look like you really enjoyed that one? Can I give you this one because it, 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 it's pretty good. It is my responsibility. Notice mine, not yours. Preaching to me, not you. It is my responsibility if I'm saved to faithfully support financially the ministry of my local church. Amen. You say, now preacher, I don't know if I agree with that or not. There's probably a lot in here you don't agree with. Amen? You say, I agree with it, I just don't do it. The Bible said, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me herewith, saith the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, you shall not be able to receive. Andrew and I was talking last night. Andrew was going to preach a sermon on the Levites. And I, we started talking about a passage over Nehemiah chapter 13 where that they closed down the treasure and moved the world into the temple. So thusly there were no offerings to take care of the Levites and the singers and the porters and they had to go out and get jobs and work and the house of God was forsaken. See, God says that every member ought to tithe so that there be supplies in his house. Look at these guys. Do they look like they've been doing without any meals? Hmm? If you've never seen these guys eat, you need to go one time. And that shows you how bad we need the offerings around here. But the things that accompany salvation is first, I make a public profession of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I get into the watery grave of baptism and in a picture I show forth my faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's like putting the uniform on. Everybody knows you're a soldier. Everybody knows whose side you're on and that automatically makes you a member of that local New Testament church because the authority to baptize rests in the church, not the individual. Amen. 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 And if you are a member of a local church, you are responsible to financially support that local church. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Upon the first day of the week, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. Say, preacher, when should I give? 
on the first day of the week. Ain't that Sunday? Ain't that today? Did you miss it? If you did, we'll take another one. <laughs> we're not embarrassed at all. No, sir, we're not. And we're not embarrassed to embrace and be responsible for those things which accompany salvation. With the same measure that you meet, it shall be with all given unto you. If you are broke, it may be because you're eating the seed that God gave you to sow. Amen. Thusly, you have crop failure every week. Well, I just can't afford the tithe. You can't afford not to. You, you just listen to me. You can't afford to let 10% of your puny little salary send you to bankruptcy. Because if you will give God his 10%, he will make your 90% go so much farther than it did before. Amen? I've got to close. It is your responsibility to unite and become a member of a local New Testament church. Now, please, don't anybody go home and say, the preacher knew I wasn't a member and he was preaching to me. <laughs> That's what's good about having a great forgetter. <laughs> I have no earthly idea. And please, if all I've got to do is pick on you I must have an awful, awful, awful boring life. <laughs> Do you understand that? It's my responsibility to faithfully support my local church because it's under him he gets glory in the church. Could I give you another one? It's my responsibility to faithfully serve within that local church. God don't save folk to sit. God saves folk to get up and get. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about giving gifts to folks who have been saved to work and to use and to utilize within that local church. He illustrates that with the human anatomy. He talks about all the members of that one body being many, but yet that one body with many members is just one body. And then he said, so also, also is Christ. We together make up the body of Christ. And we're all different members. Thank God we're all different members. We all do not have the same gifts. We all do not have the same talents. God knows I wish I could sing like some of these folks. I'd be famous or almost famous. Or at least I'd get to sing every once in a while. But I'm glad everybody's not preachers. Because this would be a messed up mess if everybody around you were preachers. So God gives members abilities like God gave my fingers abilities, hand abilities. I do not walk on my hands, although the older I get, the more I find them on the floor. <laughs> but God did not leave you out. You are gifted by the Holy Spirit Amen. to do, to perform, to make this local church that God received the glory through this church by what you do and how you serve. Amen? Amen? You said, well, I don't know what I can do. Just try something. Amen. 
And the success of this local church is dependent on you. You, if you're a member of this church, you're what makes it what it is. And you are what's keeping it from being what it should be. Because we are members of this local church. That should accompany salvation. Now this is my last one because it looks like we need to get on with it. It is my responsibility, not yours now, mine, to faithfully attend my local church. Not your privilege, your responsibility. You say, I don't need it. How's it it going? You're growing in the Lord. You've been influenced your family. I just wonder what these kids, kids is going to think about church because these kids are learning from their parents how important church is. I just wonder what they're learning from their parents that they're going to pass down to their kids in America. I'm just wondering. I'll close with this Hebrews chapter 10, if you would please. Hebrews chapter 10. Stewardship is not money. You know what I hadn't talked about hardly all? Stewardship is not money. Stewardship encompasses money. But stewardship is responsibility. Hebrews chapter 10. I don't have time to explain to you Hebrews chapter 10. Let me give you just uh, uh, maybe a synopsis of what's going on here. And I want to show you just a minute. Uh, Notice verse 9, just a minute. Verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. Jesus came to do the Father's will. I came to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that it may establish the second. You got that? I came to do thy will, God, O Father. I came to do thy will, O God. He take away the first that he may establish the second. The first priesthood. The Old Testament. The first temple. The first religious system. The first ordinances of sacrifice. I came to take away the old, and I came to install the new. Got that? You got that? All right. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, underline these next words, once for all. Because in the old, uh, the priest continually, daily, yearly offered offerings to take away sin. So I came, Jesus said, to do thy will to take away the old and establish the new. No more temple, but there's another house of God. No more Aaron priesthood, but now we have a high priest which was tempted in all fashion such as us and yet without sin. No more goats and bulls need to be offered because once and for all the sacrifice has been made. You got that? Now don't forget this now. By and every priest standing daily ministering and offering, oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, y'all write amen in your Bible right there. 
sat down on the right hand of God. The priest in the old never got to sit down. He's always had to offer another sacrifice. Another one, another one, another one. But this man, once he offered the one sacrifice, what did he do? Look in the tabernacle, look in the temple and see if there's any chairs, any tables, altars, no chairs. High priest couldn't sit down because he had to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what did he do? Sat down. <laughs> That's enough to make a Baptist shout. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. For after that, he had said before, now this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Gone. Yes, they're gone. As far as the east is from the west, my sins are gone. Gone, buried in the deepest, darkest sea of forgetfulness. My sins, thank God, are gone. Verse 19, therefore, because of all of that, having therefore boldness, brethren, boldness to enter into the holies by the blood of Jesus, you know what the high priest had to do to walk into the holies of holies? The high priest is the only one who could walk into the presence of God. And he could only enter the presence of God once a year. After he had made atonement for his personal sins, after he had washed himself clean with clean water and robed himself with the high priest robes that had bells around the hem of his garment and very cautiously he approached the veil that separated the holy from the holy of holies, separated the people from God. And with nervous anxiety, I'm sure, he approached that veil. But just in case, they put a rope around his leg because if those bells stop jingling, they give a yank because he was unworthy and the presence and holiness of God killed him immediately. Wash clean in the water. Purge from his sins by the blood. Cautiously he entered into the presence of God to make atonement for sins of the people for another year. Didn't I talk about a new and living way up there? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by what? The blood. Are you, are you listening? The blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is seeing his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Oh, is that the temple? Or could that be another house? Is Jesus Christ the high priest of a Jewish temple? Or the high priest of that place that Timothy talks about, and if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. We have a high priest today 
over the house of God, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, if you would, please. I know you're getting bored. Let us draw near. Near? Near what? Near? Is that how we should go to church? Let us draw near unto God. Let us draw near with full assurance. Faith having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience of our bodies washed with pure water. You see, we're to approach the presence of God the same way the priest was. When you come to church, you ought to come clean. When you come to church, you ought to come to church because you are right not to get right. When you come close to God and approach God, you ought to to do it, bless your heart, with full assurance that your sins are gone and you've been washed in the water of the word. Let us not only draw near, but let us Hold fast. That's verse 23. Verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Well, how can we do that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. It's your responsibility that ought to accompany salvation. You do that at 6.30 this evening You do that 7 o'clock Wednesday night. Well, I don't, th- I don't care what you think. I know what God says. And that's why we've got hodgepodge Christianity all over the country. That's why churches is going down the drain. Because it's not really important to you the things that should accompany Salvation. And I read it's required in a steward that a man be found what? Faithful. I read one time Jesus told a man, give a count of their stewardship. He said, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So stewardship is not money necessarily. It's responsibility. Are you ready? It's responsibility. It's priorities. It's faith living. 